I think we're going to set up the, the presentation. Oh, just a little bit about Opera. You know, we've been, we just raised our first round of capital. Uh, we raised about $85 million with Silver Lake and Axel KKR. You know, we've been in the big data space for, uh, for six, seven years now. And we've been uh, building a capability which is uh, science-based. You know, we have about 180 uh, PhD or similar level uh, uh, machine learning scientists in the company. Because my belief is in the big data world, uh, the ability to extract intelligence from it is going to become a differentiating factor. And so we've been uh, building a culture which can attract the scientists where they can flourish and innovate. So the, uh, the subject today is uh, man plus machine. And I was told uh, that I have uh, uh, 15 minutes to talk about uh, man, machine, and the next great frontier of productivity. So let's see what I can do. This man plus machine and this argument of you know, how the two combine has been, it's an age old uh, you know, uh, discussion. But a, at this particular moment in time, uh, the, the question is really quite, uh, quite uh, uh, germane. And the reason for that is what big data really represents is not so much big data as much as, you know, the way I think of big data is that it's sort of the instantiation of human experience. Increasingly, what big data is doing is capturing what people do on multiple venues. And it is, uh, allows new patterns to be uh, exhibited. And you use machine learning and other forms of intelligence to extract the patterns for commercial advantage. What you're seeing on the screen right now you know, is something which we have sort of built in the world of fraud, you know, where we extract data from all, all sorts of uh, sources. And so this is sort of, in a sense, I would say the instantiation of criminal experience. You know, and uh, what these are are rules firing. And increasingly, companies are tapping into this force in an increasing way. And uh, the question on the table that has been asked a lot is that if you look at the power of technology over time, what you find is that it's been substituting human labor. You know, so you find that the, you, know, you have information technology, so it sort of substitutes what people do. But I think this next, the, the next uh, evolution of this phenomena is a little different in the sense that I don't believe it substitutes as much as it enhances. You know, I'm a chess player, you know, and uh, in an interesting way in the world of chess, uh, this whole man plus machine conflict uh, has been being played out. And right now, if you look at it, a chess machine can beat pretty much any human on a consistent basis. And yet, you, you, in a sense, you see the, the, the what the future holds in terms of where chess is today. And you know, I'm going to start with sort of a, a, a sh short video from Gary Kasparov, you know, and it, uh, share with you his view on this man-machine and are the two in conflict or do they enhance each other? I believe that chess is, is a unique playing field to, to look for the combination of, this, of, of the machine's power and, uh, and uh, a human, human, human's abilities. So it's like, you know, to, um, to solve the Moravitz paradox, you know, so because it's exactly, you know, what happens, you know, we are good at something that machines are bad at and vice versa. Because when we have a game, say game between two computers, one or two advices from humans could change everything because you don't have a very strong player actually to help machine, to guide machine and just to give um, this human judgment, you know, intuitive judgment, strategic judgment to uh, uh, make sure that machine doesn't go the wrong way. And other way around, so you have two humans playing, one or two um, advices, quote unquote, from the computer could be, could be decisive. So um, in my view, you know, by, you know, by adding this, the quality of intuition to the decision making process, we can dramatically improve the results. Okay. You know, what, uh, what Gary Kasparov doesn't say is that, you know, right now, I mean, clearly, you know, the chess machine can beat pretty much any human. But what he does not mention is that an average chess player plus the chess machine can beat pretty much any grandmaster or any chess machine consistently. So in the world of chess, machine plus man is definitely superior to either machine or man. And the question on the table from, an, from the enterprise standpoint is, can you tap into this power in such a way that you can get a quantum improvement in productivity? But before we get into some examples as to what's been happening in the world of business and medicine, I mean, the, it, it's a difficult question to figure out why is it so that a, a human mind can 
create a level of output which is superior to the machine when taken in combination. And in order to, I mean, so it's a complex question, and you know, I've been reading up on this for quite a while right now. And there's a book by uh, a professor whom I admire greatly called Dr. T uh, Terence Deacon, and he's a professor at Harvard, and uh, he wrote a book called, uh, you know, the symbolic species, the coevolution of language and the brain, and he's been studying the computational methods used by, you know, uh, animals, humans, pr primates, and the like. And it's, he created a framework which I found extremely appealing, which, it, to, at least to my mind, gives some explanation as to why this is so. I mean, he, he, he breaks down uh, how people process into sort of three layers. You know, at the most bottom layer, he calls it iconic. See, this is like a moth, you know, which has a camouflage which looks like a bark of a tree, sort of a one-to-one -one association. The next is indexic, you know, which is like if you look at a a, a non-human primate or, a, you know, or a, a dog, what they do is that what they store is indexic association, which is, you know, if you hear the roar of a lion, that means danger. That's an indexic association, one-to-one -one associations. And the, the, the brains of, of, of the non-human primates essentially keep this indexic association. It doesn't abstract above it. And to some extent, what the computer is doing is that it's taking indexic associations to an entirely new level. And its ability to store and process indexic associations is, of course, extraordinary. Yet what it cannot do is what the human does, which is symbolic associations. What the human mind does is it abstracts above indexic associations and creates classes of phenomena. And it associates classes of phenomena to classes of output. And so no matter what the computer does, the human mind abstracts above it and it, and it pulls in new, new forms of information. Because if you look at the world of chess, you know, chess, in chess there are uh, 10 to the power of 109 moves, you know, which is basically more than all the atoms in the universe, right? And you have uh, com you know, computers who basically can go deep into the, into the game, and yet when a person works with a chess computer, they create a superior output. And the reason for that is they're bringing in patterns from different, uh, different games they play. They can, look out, they can look outside the computational framework. They can bring new kinds of insight and intuition to the party. And as a result, they enhance the computer output. It is this force, in essence, that uh, man plus machine uh, represents. I mean, I was just, I, in preparing for this, I was reading up some news articles, and I came across an article from the world of medicine, you know, where you know, for 10 years they've been trying to model the, an AIDS enzyme. And, uh, you know, and they simply couldn't make much progress. Uh, beyond a certain level, and they'd used you know maximum computing power. They looked at all the data, and yet when they gave this problem to a bunch of online gamers, in three weeks, the online gamers essentially cracked the code and they modeled the entire enzyme. So this is a and, and what these people did was they took patterns from different fields of activity: is human intuition, human uh, ingenuity applied to a machine output, and they cracked a code which has extraordinary impact. On, on productivity. So this is the world of chess, the world of medicine. You know, what Opera is doing and what we are doing, and I'm going to show you one or two examples, is in the world of business. I'm going to take two examples which are fairly, basically quite prosaic, you know, but it makes the point. What, the first one is collections. And I don't know, hopefully none of you have been delinquent in your bills, but it, and if you ever received a call from one of these collectors, I mean, this is a fairly large business. There are about 57 million people who are you know, in, uh, in delinquency in, in the United States. This is a system which is entirely oriented around human insight. I mean, they are information enabled, but they're not machine intelligence enabled. And if you look at any collection floor, you will find that the top 20% of collectors basically collect about 80 to 90% of the dollars, and the bottom 80% doesn't. So here what we did was we sort of looked at you know, what the top collectors do, and they essentially, they have superior ability to look at ability to pay and willingness to pay. And we applied machine intelligence to this, to this equation you know, with a view of, of, of uh, making the 80% closer to the 20%. But even here we found that no matter how much uh, we looked at the data, how much we extracted the insight, uh, they were at the point at which somebody was negotiating with a delinquent uh, customer, there were a whole bunch of other information that had to be brought into play, for instance, mood. So we created a, a system where you know, uh, the, the mood of the person 
would interact with the ability to pay and the willingness to pay uh, uh, dials, and it would and it would give the the uh, the collector a sense of where the where, where, where the where the delinquent customer is, so they could negotiate better. Similarly, there was new information like you know, if, does this person just did they get a new job, and you know, based on the answer, the dial would move. Just a simple application like this. You know, essentially resulted in about 35 to 45 percent improvement in productivity of the floor, which just tells you, you know, here is a system which is basically populated. Let's let's you know call a spade a spade with average people, and yet, you know, by the application of these methods, the average becomes in a sense a grandmaster of collections. Let's take another example, which we have been working in the world of mortgages. I mean, most of you are familiar with the credit meltdown, you know, in 2000 uh, in 2009. And, and this is real data, you know, which says this is California, and you know, the best of machine intelligence at the time, the green is good credit, red is you know, not so good credit, right? And you know, that's what the machine intelligence said, and it took all the information, all the big data out there, right? And, this is, and so people were obviously lending to the areas with green. And yet, uh, you know, what we did was we overlaid uh, what would happen, a question that was asked was, what would happen if unemployment went up? Nothing in the data says it's going to go up, but somebody looks around, looks at the, you know, the excess capacity, all the mania, and says unemployment is likely to go up because there's going to be a downturn. And this is what happens with a slight increase in unemployment. That same map now you see is all red. So this, it is in this combination, if this had been at work at the time, you, know, you would have found enormous problems averted. So what, I've, what I've been showing you thus far, you know, is sort of the power of man plus machine combination. I went to the world of chess, the world of medicine, the world of business. And in a big data world, I mean, these questions are obviously coming to, uh, coming to the fore. But yet, we know where uh, most of our client base are the very, very large companies like American Express, Citicorp, Morgan Stanley, and the like. And you know, and the challenge for them is how do they trans transition from the way they were doing it into, the, into what's the requirement in a big data world? And as we work with them in order to tap into this new force of productivity, you know, I sort of distilled it down to a few key new rules of engagement you know, as these companies start navigating the new world. And they just sort of boil it down to four or five key points. I mean, the first point which they have to understand increasingly is that in a big data world, you know, data is a river, not a pond. The old way of looking at it was data warehouses where they would capture data, they would mine it, they had the luxury of doing that. But in a world where the rate of data generation has far outstripped the ability to capture it, I mean, that is no longer possible. Which comes to the next point is that, you know, within Opera itself, I'm trying to ban the word data almost entirely because our goal is to convert big data into small data, which is signal. Increasingly, and I've seen some of the earlier presentations, increasingly, scientifically, the key is to be able to pull the signal out from the data. And as you navigate the river, to extract the signal without having to capture all the data. And the technological requirements is increasingly uh, in, in that direction. The third point you saw, like in the mortgage example, it's a glass box, you know, not, a, not, a, not, the, not a black box. And this is non-trivial because if you look at you know, consumer credit, if you look at all, all, you know, all the various scores, like the FICO score, these are all black boxes. People don't really understand why a judgment, why a judgment is arrived at by the machine. And it, as we go into big data where the role of machine intelligence is growing, it's increasingly important to have transparency so that human judgment can be applied, because that's where the power lies. The fourth point is, uh, you know, and this is again, I use this somewhat facetiously, so it's still IT, but it's no longer information technology, what I call it intelligence technology. And why is that? Because you've got to distribute uh, intelligence to the front line increasingly. And the whole information technology revolution occurred in a world where information itself was scarce. But that has changed. You know, information is abundant. So the, so the onus is shifting to extracting intelligence, not capturing information. You know, one situation we're looking at right now, which is dealing with some front-end advisors, they have 89 sources of information. The IT is giving them all the information they could possibly need. Guess what? They've just completely tuned out. You know, so what we are doing is we are trying to sort of distill it down and simplify the world yet again. And last but not least, therefore, is man plus machine, not man versus machine. You know, I'm going to end with, uh, you know, the, 
I mean, this is what the, the company's been betting on this. So I'm going to end a little bit with a sort of a personal story. I mean, I mean, we've been in existence for about seven years right now, right? And about four, five, three, four years ago, I started really concentrating and hiring machine learning scientists and the like. And the thing that triggered it was a conversation and a presentation I saw by, uh, the, by the chief research scientist uh, at the Broad Institute, which basically maps the disease genomes. You know, it's a collaboration between Harvard and MIT. And he made a very profound comment, which has really st struck, and I want to just share it with you. Uh, he said that, uh, you know, if you were looking at the world of medicine in the year 2020, and you were looking back, say, at the year 2010, he said the difference in medicine will be the same difference as in chemistry, uh, pre-periodic tables, post-periodic tables. He said we are living in a world where, where we're looking at Moore's law on a log scale. He said, what you're looking at today will be so vastly different from what you're looking at today, uh, two years from now. And all of this is engendered by the big data phenomena we're looking at. I don't think any com company is immune from this sort of tectonic shift that is occurring. And you're going to find an entirely new class of winners and losers. And I, we are into an era now where you know, pe if people can find a way of exploiting the power of machine intelligence and combining it with human insight, you know, they will, in fact, make, create a vast difference between themselves and their nearest competitors. Thank you.